Think of the idea of limits. One limit on the right hand here as consciousness. Extreme, lively sensitivity. And on the other hand, we'll take the opposite limit, which is geological. The stone, the blind energy, the electrical force without any consciousness whatsoever. These are observable things. We see the living human being on one extreme and we see the stone or the fire on the other. Now, our 19th century mythologist wants to describe this limit in terms of this one. He wants to say that consciousness is nothing but a very complicated form of minerals. Why can't you go the other way and just as easily say, minerals are a very simple form of consciousness. That works, doesn't it? I mean, after all, here is this mineral. I knock it, and it says that to me. This is a rudimentary form of consciousness. This thing inside is not making a noise to itself, because that requires ears. But in some way, this thing is going to itself, it's shaking like that. And that's its consciousness, its response, its resonance. It isn't totally unconscious, but its consciousness is extremely simple. Now, you may think I'm spinning fairy stories, but is that any more of a fairy story than to say that your consciousness is nothing but chemistry? I mean, you think you're conscious, and that you have this high and mighty state of affairs, but actually, of course, if we look at this very realistically, all this is just um, colloidal substances bubbling around. See, both uh, that, that, that story and the other story can be made to seem equally fanciful. But the question is this, if I say about the gong, look, my friend, I respect you because you are a little bit conscious. See? You relate to me, you're, you're kind of a younger brother. And, um, you know, then uh, there's something endearing and warm about this attitude to things. Whereas if I say, Psht, you're just a piece of metal, and as a matter of fact, I'm just a piece of metal too. That's a kind of insult. Now the people who believe that are really suicidal maniacs. They want to put themselves down. They are against their own life. And they take a great pride in being that way, and they call it being realistic. And uh, it's, I, I'm only saying it's a better gamble to take it the other way and say, uh, the best thing you can say about it, that this is a living being, but not so much of a living being as a snail or something that actually wanders along and wiggles. <laughs> so, you see, the pressure upon us of the whole mythology of the 19th century the whole attitude of putting down the universe because the previous myth had been too uncomfortably alive is simply a way of looking at things. Let me give another illustration of the same thing. <coughs> if you study the various forms of life from the standpoint of natural selection, you may come up with a rationalization for everything. Somebody wants to know, why do butterflies have eyes on their wings? Some butterflies. Well, somebody scratches his head and says, oh, well, there must be an explanation for that. There's an explanation for everything. Why is there an explanation for everything? Because the universe is really a tight engineering job. So, why do some butterflies have eyes? Well, it so happened that some fluke of a butterfly once got an eye on its wing, 
and birds would avoid it because that eye looked at them and it was just too much. So those butterflies that had eyes on their wings bred, whereas the butterflies that didn't have eyes got eaten up more easily. Although some of them had other alternatives, they, because of not having eyes, they were invisible and the birds couldn't see them. And so more of that kind survived, although those with the terrifying eyes survived, and uh, so they didn't get eaten up either. So those it, it tended to multiply. So this is a perfectly easy, simple explanation of why butterflies have eyes on their wings. Of other things, uh, some birds with extraordinary plumages, which look uh, so obvious that uh, anybody could catch them, any cat, any hunter. No, they survived because they were so attractive to their females. And so they bred very well. As a matter of fact, this isn't true, they didn't. And, uh, uh, you know, but any explanation will do, provided it seems to explain. Now that is one way of looking at things. You can make an extremely consistent theory for the different kind of species of flowers and birds and insects and all their markings and so on, just why they have them. But on the other hand, you can equally well explain it in a completely different way. You can say, uh, it would be exceedingly dreary if there were nothing but one uniform type of life. You're supposing there had never been anything but amoebas, and there were just globules, and they divided, and then they divided again, and then they divided again. You know, that could have gone on, and it could have been terribly efficient, because the minute you went to hit an amoeba, you would strike it, but suddenly find you'd killed only one of them, because it split just before you hit. It's a marvelous arrangement. Uh, and you know, they could split very fast. You could suddenly go at another with two hammers, hoping to catch the both amoebas, but suddenly they split, 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 and there were eight of them before you knew where you were. That would be fine. But actually, or the reason why there is all this colossal variety and all these patterns on butterflies' wings is that nature is a poet and is simply having a wonderful time making all this variety and doing all these various things. And that explanation is just as plausible as the efficient explanation. It's a, you, you see, the philosophy is to a large extent a matter of taste. What sort of explanations suit your personality? If you're, a, if you're an anal retentive type and rather tight, then you like the efficient explanation. On the other hand, if you're an effusive type, you like the poetic explanation. Uh, <laughs> But uh, there are, though, beyond that, certain considerations of uh, which of these explanations affords better games. And uh, the, the, the economic anal retentive explanation can give good games up to a point. Because there's all the thrill of working out the chains of interconnection, all the reasoning whereby finally with, you go through all sorts of rational conniptions and explain why the butterfly has a big eye on its wing. Fine. But where do you end up? You end up in a mechanical straitjacket. You've got to be careful along the other line of approach that you just don't end up in a morass. <coughs> Uh, you could do that. So you, 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 you look for a middle way. But the point that emerges from all this is <coughs> don't be bamboozled into fearing that the black will win. Because <clears throat> the white is the only thing there is. And the black, the nothing that surrounds it, will eventually engulf it. All these are, <coughs> as it were, nursery stories to terrify children. You live in a cosmos where the light of consciousness and the darkness of unconsciousness go back and forth. 
just as the crests and the troughs of the waves. And this situation of yang and yin, positive and negative, is exceedingly productive. It's like a male and a female who become the parents of all sorts of children. And out of yang and yin, black and white, come all these adventures through the original stratagem <coughs> of pretending that the one is and the other isn't, that yang is and that yin isn't. Both have equally good arguments on their side. And one now wins, and the other now wins. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But don't be deceived. The two are always together. And the thing that you most fear the awful, awful thing that could happen. Think it through. What could that be? What could the very end be? What is it that you dread? And you'll find out that if you go down, 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 down into what you dread, be swallowed up, be annihilated, let the horrible scorpion, spider mother, the octopus thing catch you and take you down into its inmost guts. What will it do with you? Why, it will transform you into itself. And then when you are it, as I said, every creature feels like it's a human being. <laughs> because after all, uh, that's I. So fish, when they've eaten up something, and that thing has become them, you know, and then the fish looks around and says, gee, that was a good dinner. And it feels human. And the fish looks around and it sees things that aren't fish, and they look like cows and uh, human beings wandering around there. They look like um, predatory monsters of some kind. Awful looking things. Ghastly teeth and uh, weird, un inhumane arms and legs on them. Not nice, uh, orderly fins and tails and beautiful scales on the side, like a, a really good person should look. <laughs> so, you know, this thing, this thing of death and of being transformed is where our life reaches a certain point where it has to go bloop. And in the moment you go bloop, you forget. You lose control, you see. That's the sensation. When control is going, you're just on the verge of the crisis where it's going to go bloop. And you say, well, where was I? Gee, this is strange. I'm alive. I don't remember where I was before. That's the sensation of coming to birth. And you grow and grow and you become more familiar with this and more familiar. When you're completely familiar, it goes bloop. And you're new all over again, see, it's quite different. We can never believe, you see, when it gets to the point where we know it's about to go bloop, we never believe that it will go into, into life we always think it's going to go into something dreadful. But you see, once you know, <laughs> it's, it's going to keep flipping. And uh, the only thing is to go with that flip. See, get ready to go. Are you ready? Boop. <laughs> then you can laugh. Because you know there's no way out. <laughs>